In this video, I'm going to show you how to publish fair data. And if you watch this video to the end, you're going to leave with a short checklist of points that if you follow, you'll be sure that you're publishing fair data too. You might be watching this video today because your institution or your funding requires you to publish fair data. But by the end of this video, you'll not only learn how to publish fair data, I hope you'll also want to publish fair data because you'll see why it matters. I want people to be excited about publishing fair data because they understand how it benefits a broader scientific community, society in general, and even the person publishing the data. So get comfortable, let's dive in. So let's start with a quick overview of the FAIR principles. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, the findable and accessible principles uh, you should mostly be thinking about where you're going to publish your data and how the data center or platform that you publish with um, makes your data available to other people. Whereas the interoperable and reusable uh, principles relates mostly to what you're publishing, the data format that you're going to use, the conventions that you're going to adhere to within that data format, and uh, the license that you're going to attach to your data. Let's consider who might want to reuse your data. Many scientists assume that their data are only interesting to someone who's read their article. But this is often not the case. In fact, it can be quite surprising how widely some data sets get reused. Data are valuable in their own right. And I think as a scientific community, we need to separate the tasks of publishing data and publishing papers. In the interest of open science, data can be published well before your paper is, ideally as soon as it's been collected, processed and quality controlled. Data don't need to only serve the original research that they were collected for. They can be reused in new studies too. And I'd like to encourage you to also think about how you can integrate existing data sets into your own research. Fair data can also be integrated into much larger services and platforms that can benefit society. So by publishing fair data, you can contribute to things that are much larger than your own research. Let me show you some examples. This is GBIF, which is a global biodiversity information facility. GBIF hosts the largest collection of biodiversity data on the planet. You can enter the name of a species and find out where it's been observed and when. These data are aggregated together from over 100,000 datasets, contributed by everyone from scientists right down to hobbyists just taking pictures of organisms on their smartphones. If we want to protect life on Earth, we first need the data to tell us where it exists. You can filter the data based on when the organisms were observed or based on other parameters. And when you're ready, you can download everything into a single CSV file, which you can use in your own research. Next, we have the Ocean Virtual Laboratory. This tool lets you analyze a variety of different ocean variables for any given day over the past few decades. Currently, the data comes from satellite products, but I can see a lot of potential here for expanding this to include high-resolution, one-off scientific datasets in the future. This could provide more accurate insights, including what's happening below the surface. And my final example is Destination Earth, which was launched this year. It's an ambitious initiative by the European Union to create a digital twin of our planet. Destination Earth aims to provide highly detailed simulations of Earth's natural systems, combining data from various sources like satellites, um, sensors, and scientific research. I think this digital twin is going to be an invaluable tool, not only for scientists, but also for policymakers and industries too. I hope it's going to help them make data-driven decisions to tackle challenges that we face like climate change, natural disasters, and sustainable development. Just imagine being able to test the impact of different policies or interventions in a virtual environment before we implement them into our real world. All of this is only possible at scale with FAIR data. And by publishing FAIR data, you too can contribute to initiatives like these. But this all starts with making your data as easy to find and access as possible. So let's jump into the where to publish your data part. 
I think most people are aware of this by now, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, your data shouldn't just be made available on request to the corresponding author of your paper, nor should they just be tucked away in the supplementary materials. Your data should be published independently with a reputable data center. So that's going to be the first item in our checklist. Publish your data with a reputable data center. And this is point F4 of the FAIR principles. Data and metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. But here's the thing, not all data centers are equal. You want to be publishing your data with a data center that maximizes the potential reach and impact of your data. So let's have a look at the rest of the principles. The first principle undefinable, F1, states that data and metadata are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. This means that your data needs an identifier that is unique in any context where it might be viewed. And persistent means that that identifier should never change. There might be other data sets with the same title. There might be other data sets collected on the same day or in the same place. Globally unique identifiers provide you with a robust way of referring to a data set without any ambiguity. In most cases, this identifier is going to be a DOI, which is a digital object identifier. DOIs look like this, and they can be made clickable, so that when you click on them, you're taken directly to the landing page of that resource. In academia, we're already quite familiar with DOIs because we use them for articles as well. But if you're sharing either an article or a data set with someone else, the best practice is to share with them a DOI instead of a URL because the link to the URL might break over time. So let's add a key criterion to the first item on our checklist. Publish your data with a reputable data center that assigns your data set a globally unique and persistent identifier, typically a DOI. Now, you don't need to create the DOI yourself. Most good data centers are doing this for you. But I've seen a couple of examples where the data centers are not providing individual data sets with a DOI. So just be a little bit mindful of this. F2 is data are described with rich metadata, and that's defined by R1 below, where R1 is the first point here under reusable, and we'll come back to that later. I'm actually going to divide these points up and reword this to data are described with rich discovery metadata. Um, discovery metadata are metadata that helps someone find or discover your data. But we can leave the use metadata that helps someone reuse your data later for under R1. And then F3 states that metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data it describes. Discovery metadata includes things like when and where the data were collected, uh, the authors of the data sets, some keywords, basically anything anyone might want to use to search for data or discover the data. This is one place where there can be big differences between good and less good data centers. According to this principle, there should be rich metadata, meaning that you should be thorough with the metadata that you're providing. I think some data centers are popular because they make publishing data quick and easy. And whilst that convenience is great, it shouldn't come at the expense of rich metadata requirements. Let's add another criterion to our checklist. Publish your data with a data center that has comprehensive discovery metadata requirements. The more detailed your metadata, the easier it is for someone to find and use your data effectively. You might ask, how do I know if the data center has rich metadata requirements or not? Well, one thing you can do is test how easy it is to find data that have already been published with that data center. At the Arctic Data Center, which I am affiliated with, it's possible to search by where data are collected using a bounding box on this map here. I can also search by the date that the data were collected, or I can use some specific keywords, look for the author of a data set, and so on. If a data center has a platform like this, it's a good indication that it has rich discovery metadata requirements, because every data set indexed needs to have values for each of these search criteria. So let's add another criterion to our checklist. Make sure you've tested 
how easy it is to find data already published with that data center. Let's move on to A for accessible. A1 is data or metadata are retrievable by their identifier using a standardized communications protocol. And this is divided into subpoints. A1.1 is the protocol is open, free, and universally implementable. And A1.2 is the protocol allows for authentication and authorization procedure where necessary. This point is really important, but I think it's something that's often overlooked or perhaps oversimplified. So let's take some time on this. Uh, this is going to get a bit technical, but don't worry. It's a job of the data center staff to provide these protocols. You as a data provider just need to be able to recognize uh, which data centers are providing which protocols. And I'll give you some tips on how to check for this. So firstly, what is a standardized communications protocol? Well, a standardized communications protocol is a way of exchanging data and metadata over the internet in a way that's interoperable, meaning that that data exchange can be done between different platforms and systems. It should also be persistent, meaning that that data exchange remains stable through time. One example that everyone will be familiar with is HTTP or HTTPS, which is a protocol for making web resources available. Data can also be made available programmatically over an API. For geospatial data, there's the OGC API suite, which stands for Open Geospatial Consortium. So they provide open interoperable standards tailored to geospatial data. This is far more efficient than the everyone build their own home cooked API approach that some data centers take. I could do a whole video on the OGC standards. In fact, I could probably do several videos on that. So if you're interested in that, just leave me a comment. And another really important one is that a data center should have protocols designed to allow someone to retrieve the metadata, the discovery metadata, related to all the data sets that have been published with that data center. Examples of this are OAI PMH, which stands for Open Archives Initiatives Protocol for Metadata Harvesting and OGC CSW, which is related to the OGC API that we mentioned above. And CSW stands for Catalog Service for the Web. There are hundreds of data centers in the world, and it simply isn't practical for someone who's interested in data to go and look through all of them. So these metadata harvesting and cataloging protocols can be used to build shared platforms for data. So someone can just look at a single platform to find data from many different contributing data centers. For example, this is the SIOS data access portal, where SIOS stands for the Svalbard Integrated Arctic Earth Observing System. So this provides a single access point for data relevant to Svalbard. Now, SIOS don't host any data, this isn't a data center. Instead, they harvest discovery metadata from contributing data centers and include links to the data where they're stored. They can also use different standardized communications protocols that the data centers provide to build services on top of the data, like visualization of the data sets on the SIOS platform. So if you have data relevant to Svalbard, it's a good idea to publish your data to one of the data centers that contribute to SIOS, and I'm showing them on the screen now. This is SION, which stands for Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks. And this does something similar to SIOS, but for the whole Arctic. Now, this data access portal is supported by the Arctic Passion Project, who also provide me with some funding to make videos like this one. The portal looks much the same as the SIOS portal, and here are the data centers that contribute to SION. We also have this portal called Polder, which looks at both poles, the north and south. And here are the data centers that contribute to that. And this here is GeoPortal, which is implemented and operated by the European Space Agency. And this includes data from satellites, airplanes, drones, and in situ sensors on the ground. And there's a lot of different data centers that are contributing to this. You might have noticed that some popular data centers aren't on these lists, and I thought about naming them here, but I'm not going to. But this is probably because they're not following these metadata cataloging and harvesting protocols. 
Standards and conventions have to be used here because it simply isn't practical for every single data portal to both develop and maintain through time custom links to each of these data centers. Let's revisit point F2 again here, that the data are described with rich discovery metadata. These metadata should also follow commonly used conventions, like ISO 19115, or perhaps GCMD diff. So to conclude, standardized communications protocols provide people with different ways to find and access your data. And they can also be used to integrate your data into services like Destination Earth or Ocean Virtual Lab that I showed earlier in the video, and also other services that haven't been developed yet. So returning to our list now, when choosing a data center, think about what platforms or portals you want your data to contribute to and look at what data centers are contributing to them. And also, think about how you want people to be able to access your data, e.g. via API or maybe OGC API, and see what your data center is providing. Now, unfortunately, it's not always easy to find this information, so I would say email the data center if you're not sure. And this goes for any of the points above. Maybe if enough people ask the same data center for the same thing, they'll start providing that service. I would like to have offered you with some more concrete advice on this here, but as things are today, I think this is the best I can do. Then back to the FAIR principles. Note that here in A1.2, it says that authentication and authorization are allowed where necessary. So this is where FAIR data doesn't necessarily have to be open access. If you think about it, there's a lot of reasons why someone might not want their data to be openly available. For example, it might include sensitive information related to uh, people or an endangered species or perhaps um, images of a sensitive location. And the FAIR data principles allow for this. Principle A2 says that metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. And this should also be extended to data that are not open access. The metadata should still be available, even if you might have to reduce the resolution of the coordinates, for example. So if the data have been removed or restricted for some reason, there should still be some information about the data. So if someone clicks on a link for some data that's been removed, they should still be directed to that page, and that page should include some information about what's happened to the data. I think that's fair. So now you hopefully have a better understanding of where you should be publishing your data, but now let's discuss what you should be publishing if you want your data to be considered fair. So we're going to start with interoperability. And I think of the four principles, this is probably the one that's most often overlooked or perhaps misunderstood. Now, I think there's a good reason for this. Five or six years ago, before I started working in data management, I probably wouldn't have been able to give you a good definition for what interoperability means. So we'll start there. Interoperability refers to the ability for different systems, devices, applications, or organizations to work together seamlessly. Now, the example that's most often given is that if you go back 10 years, it used to feel like every single mobile phone that you used to buy uh, used to have a different charging cable. Now, most phones are using USB-C. So if you get a new phone, you can still use your old charger. If you've visited a friend's house and you've forgotten your charger, you can probably borrow theirs. Now let's put this in the context of data. Truly interoperable data should be able to be used by a range of different softwares on a range of different operating systems. So if you have a hundred similar data sets that are all adhering to the same standards and conventions, then you should be able to integrate any one of those into your workflow without having to make major changes to your code. It's impossible to build scalable services on top of the data if everyone has their own custom way of structuring their data within a file. So we need to reduce the degrees of freedom so that if I am creating a file and you're creating a file using the same data, they should be structured in exactly the same way or as near as possible. If you read the article by Wilkinson and colleagues that originally um, documented the FAIR principles, you'll see that there's a strong focus on machine readability. 
This means that the software should be able to read and understand the contents of your data. It means that data managers like me might be able to develop services on top of your data. For example, including some on-the-fly visualization of your data on its landing page. Or including some options to aggregate data from multiple data sets into a single file at the request of the data user. So interoperability makes it easier to share data between people and even between disciplines. So let's dive into the principles. I1 is that data or metadata use a formal, accessible, shared, and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. So this point is referring to the choice of data format. Formal in this context means that the data and metadata are well-defined and structured according to certain rules. So that means that if you have 100 files created by 100 different people, the data and the metadata should all be structured in the same way in each of those. Accessible means that the data and metadata should be easily readable and usable, allowing for access restrictions to the data as described in A1.2, of course. So the data format shouldn't be designed to work only on a certain type of software. So not some file format that's unique to some expensive modeling software, but also not XLSX files that are designed for Microsoft Excel, even if you can open them with other spreadsheet editors. Shared means that the data and metadata are described using well-documented community standards. And broadly applicable means that the data format and those community standards can be used to encode a variety of different types of data, perhaps from different disciplines. Principle I2 is that the data and metadata use vocabularies that follow fair principles. This means that you can't just call your data and metadata terms whatever you like. A control vocabulary is a collection of terms that are hosted online. NERC, which is the Natural Environment Research Council, hosts what's called a vocabulary server, and this hosts a number of different controlled vocabularies. There are controlled vocabularies for all different types of things, like units, for example, this one. We have keywords, like the GCMD keywords, that stands for the Global Change Master Directory. And there's also lots of different vocabularies for different variable names. Uh, this one is the CF, Climate and Forecast Standard Names. And these are used to provide a standardized name for variables within CF NetCDF files. Each term within a controlled vocabulary should have a description, as you can see here, as well as an identifier. This means that someone creating a dataset should have read this description of a term before they chose to use it. They can refer to which control vocabulary they've taken the term from. And then someone who finds the data later can also come and read this description of the term. So hopefully by doing this, the data creator and the data user have some shared understanding of what's meant by that term. And this also makes the data and metadata terms machine readable because a machine can also be told what is meant by that term. Principle I3 is that data or metadata include qualified references to other data or metadata. You can include within your dataset references to any other datasets or any other publication for that matter that you've used to help you create your dataset. So let's add another item to our checklist. Choose a data format that is software independent has a standardized structure, includes data and metadata within it. Those data and metadata terms should be taken from controlled vocabularies. And the standards should be well documented and also maintained. So then you'll have some confidence that people will still be using that standard in the future. So which data formats are interoperable? We have to think both about the data format, but also the conventions that we use within it. People often think about formats like JSON or XML to be interoperable, but they're only interoperable if there are some standards that define how this data and metadata are structured within that file. If you just have some customized JSON or XML file, that isn't machine readable. Even a NetCDF file is not necessarily interoperable but a CF NetCDF file, 
complying with the climate and forecast conventions should be. One nice thing about CFNet's EDF files is their versatility. You can encode a range of different types of data within a CFNet CDF file, and that makes it easier to share data between disciplines. For example, CFNet CDF can handle gridded climate models, time series of data, vertical profiles, perhaps from a CTD or a borehole, data from instruments that move whilst they're recording, perhaps point clouds or DEMs, satellite imagery, and there's many more examples that you can read here on the screen. And this is by no means a complete list. Essentially, CFNet CDF files support most types of geospatial data that can be represented on a grid with any number of dimensions. If you want to learn more about NetCDF files, I have a number of different videos where I talk about them on this channel, including this video, where I introduce CFNet CDF and the conventions that you should be using with it a file. I also have this playlist on how to work with NetCDF files in Python, and this other playlist for how to work with NetCDF files in R. We also have Darwin Core archives. These were originally designed for biodiversity data, that is when and where an organism's been observed, but they can now be used to encode a lot of different data related to that. For example, measurements, um, traits, fossil specimens, data derived from DNA, um, some experimental data. I have a whole video about Darwin Core archives and how to create them, so I'll put a link to that in the description. I also have another video where I discuss the Nansen Legacy Template Generator, which is a template generator you can use to create Excel templates. And these templates are designed so that it's easy to create a Darwin Core archive out of them. There are other data formats out there that are fair compliant or more or less fair compliant, and I'm sure there's more been developed and designed as well. Let's have a discussion about other data formats in the comments. Reusability should be a relatively quick one because there's some overlap with interoperability here. Principle R1 is that data or metadata are richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. And this is broken down into three subpoints. R1.1 is that data or metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. So you need to assign a license for your data. I'm going to go through the three most commonly used licenses here. Probably the most commonly used is version four of the CC BY license. That's the Creative Commons license. So to use this, you just include the canonical URL, this one here, in your metadata. This license states that anyone can use your data free of charge, but they have to credit you if they do so. So they can do that by citing your data set in their list of references in the same way that they'll cite any other publication. And of course, they should include the DOI within this citation string. And you should also cite your own data sets in the papers that you write. Many journals have these data availability statements, but you should list your data here as well as in your list of references not instead of. This is really important if a data center wants to provide statistics on how often your data set has been cited. They're gonna scan through different publications and look through these list of references for the different DOIs. One data center that's doing this already is GBIF. You can see this here. And the neat thing about this is you can even see which publications have actually used this data. Most data centers aren't doing this yet, but I think this is really neat, and I'd like to encourage more data centers to provide this information. I think people are going to be more motivated to publish data if they can keep track of how often it's been used in the future. And who knows, maybe Google Scholar in the future will provide some metrics for tracking number of citations on data sets in the same way that they're currently doing for paper publications at the moment. Other licenses I often see are this CC by share alike which means that if someone derives something new from your data, that derivation also has to be shared with the same CC BY share and like license. And the other one is this CC BY non-commercial license. And this provides a restriction so that the data can't be used for commercial purposes. But I would say be careful here because commercial can cover a wide range of different things, including uh, perhaps science communication magazines that you might need to pay for, for example. 
And you might want your data to be able to contribute to these. So just bear in mind that not all commercial ventures are evil. So we're going to add to our checklist, choose a license, for example, CC by 4.0 or CC by 4.0 share alike. Principle R1.2 is that data or metadata are associated with detailed provenance. Provenance is the history and origin of the data. So you use provenance metadata to describe how the data were collected or created, how they've been processed, and if so, by who and when. In most fair compliant data sets, there are specific terms in the metadata for, to describe the provenance. For example, in the CF conventions used in CF net CDF files, you have the source and history terms. I'm not going to add another item to our checklist because I think this is already encompassed by most good interoperable data formats, but bear this in mind. Principle R1.3 is that data or metadata meet domain relevant community standards. In this case, we're talking about the use metadata where we referred to the discovery metadata earlier undefinable. Use metadata helps someone to use the data, things like units, variable names, and so on. So we already touched upon this under the interoperable principle, but I guess the only thing I want to add here is that there should be a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes as described here. So be thorough and accurate with how much uh, use metadata you're including. So that's the last of the fair data management principles. Let's have a read through our checklist. We have publish your data with a reputable data center. That data center should assign your data set a globally unique and persistent identifier, typically a DOI. The data center should have comprehensive discovery metadata requirements. And it should test how easy it is to find data already published with that data center. That'll give you an impression of how findable your own data will be if you publish your data there. You should think about what platforms or portals you want your data to contribute to and look at what data centers are contributing to them. It might be a good idea to publish your data with one of those data centers. And think about how you want people to be able to access your data. For example, using API or maybe some different OGC API tools. And see what services the data center you want to publish with is providing. So with all of these points above, if you're not sure, email the data center and ask them what they're offering. The next point on the checklist is to choose a data format. And a fair compliant data format should be software independent. It should have a standardized structure. It should include data and metadata within it. And those data and metadata terms should come from controlled vocabularies. Both the data format and the conventions used within the data format should be well documented and maintained. And some examples of fair compliant data formats are CFNet CDF and Darwin Core Archives. And then the final item on our checklist is to assign a license. For example, the CC by 4.0 license or the CC by 4.0 share alike license. And that's everything. If you found this video useful, please click on the like button, share the video with your colleagues so they can also learn how to publish fair data. And I'll be making more videos in the future, teaching you how to work with fair data. So if you don't want to miss them, click on the subscribe button. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.